Hi everybody. Today we are going to talk about uncovering production issues with real world workload emulation. My name is Shiva Pahawa and I am I am accompanied with Swati Chaudhary. To give you a brief about what we are going to talk about, we are going to give you a brief introduction about the problem statement, storage architecture and its strengths, benefits of SDS and composable architecture, real world environment, enterprise workloads, and our test methodology to start with uh, there was traditional storage which was very well established right which was pro proven reliability uh, like um, scsi directly attached scsi interface sas uh, san interface nas das etc but uh, it lacked management capabilities in which we could not centrally manage because of which it was inefficient in such a way that you would either over provision a storage device or you would under utilize a storage device right so is with compute so it was not very flexible for us to be able to uh, scale or be able to provision these the storage to uh, other uh, required machines because it was directly provisioned to a server now because of the economic um, model we had to come up with something better in which hci played a role uh, hyperconverged infrastructure where it was easy to manage and rapidly it could deploy but then the scope of it uh, of the applications that it would deploy was very limited there were only very few standard applications that it would support and adding newer application would take time and energy now most of these hardware was uh, commodity boxes which was vendor specific which means we had to deal with vendor specific uh, drivers and it was fixed building block in which there was certain configurations that we could configure but it was not very flexible when it comes to picking the configurations that's where composable architecture uh, came into existence because the composable architecture was app centric because the real customer needs is through the applications that they run so the if the the uh, infrastructure would support the application instead of the platform right which most of the other uh, traditional architecture failed in in which you could in in traditional architecture you would uh, assign storage to the platform rather than application so if we have an app centric design we would directly provision storage to the app and uh, the the underlying storage or underlying compute would be uh, treated as a pool disaggregated pool in which you know any cpu or any compute resource or any storage resource can be treated as a pool of resource can be utilized for the best capabilities that it has or supports uh, which will reduce the capex and the opex and this is designed for scale out architecture uh this is typical for uh, a cloud kind of a platform uh, so it's well suited in a cloud platform right cloud kind of an environment to talk a little more about how a cloud architecture looks like um there is a hardware pool where you have a mix of compute storage nodes which could be multiple protocols like nvme sas and fabric right and there might be mixed nodes where you would have compute and uh, uh, storage but they are they both will be all these will be treated as pool of resources and there will be a hypervisor on top of it which will or an orchestrator which will either create a virtual machine or a, 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 a container and uh, based on the application needs like for example if a back application is demanding for backup it might need more of a, a storage resource than compute resource and if an application is looking for something like deduplication it would require compute as well as storage so compose these this particular storage plus uh, compute entity make it clustered in which it is highly available 
in which there is no single point of failure and add additional storage defined uh, you know software defined storage services where you might have tiering for you know faster availability high availability for not failing at one given uh, app, one given instance uh, erasure coded in which you know you can uh, split your or or break up your data into multiple chunks etc and the uh, and then the orchestrator um, uh, would uh, uh, add additional applications on top of it and provision this particular underlying subsystem to it, right? Uh, and the application can scale out on demand. So initially it was a platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Now we can say anything as a service, right? Including the function as a service. So function utilizes the underlying resources and frees it up when it's done using it. So there is a shared set of resources which can be uh, from multiple vendors. And uh, all look the same. It might be a CPU from one window is to a CPU from another, but it would look like a computational resource, self-contained and stateless, right? Applications are self-contained in which application has everything that it needs and it spawns or it creates its subsystem based on its needs and it's stateless. If one application fails, one application instance fails, the other application instance can take over from that. But the underlying storage is stateful, right? So you will never lose the storage because of the SDS services as well as the way we have configured the underlying uh, pool of storage. Virtual everything, including from uh, storage virtualization like SRIOV, then compu uh, computational, uh, you know, virtualization like provisioning vCPUs, etc., including RAM. So at any given time, there is no single point of failure. So an application can move from one uh, underlying node to another seamlessly. You know, if there is a case of failure, compose uh, based on a use case. So basically, the application composes the underlying subsystem based on its use case, scale on demand and centralized control using API services. With that, we need to look at what is a, a software defined storage and its benefits. So what, what does uh, software defined storage uh, compose of or what are the benefits of software defined storage? In the high level, it is cloud native, application centric and simple in nature. Why do we, uh, what, what do you mean by cloud native, right? It has got high availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability in which there is, uh, if one instance fails, there is always a second instance which is available at that given time. Scalable, if the application demand increases, the, the load increases, it can scale up and scale down based on load. Performance in which there is multiple uh, entry points where there are multiple instances of the application running in parallel and each application instance can take the payload of whatever application is free at that given time. Consistency as to the most recently written data should be accessible and should not be corrupted. With all this keeping in mind, there is durability and there is plethora of storage services. When you talk about software defined storage, there are lots and lots of storage services that either increase the performance or reliability or consistency, etc. cetera. Uh, some, to name some, thin provisioning, deduplication, replication, zones, self-healing, etc. It's platform agnostic in which you know, there is one platform in on which any any underlying storage can work. There is no window lock. There is multiple drivers based on your application needs. You can choose one driver from another resource aggregation. So you see from one central location, you can see a, an entire set of an entire data center, which can be utilized as a pool of resource, a centralized API on demand storage resources and you know uh, it reduces the underlying complexity in which you don't need to really know the underlying um, uh, protocols or applications or how to talk to that particular underlying subsystem but uh, the apis would do that for you in in the form of drivers the whole storage life cycle can be managed from api from right from creation to access to destruction 
industry collaboration and development there is about 36.7 percent year on year growth in sds platforms and api centric so what do we mean by api centric there is a policy dri- driven uh, uh, io payload right so application when it's developed it has a policy file which which uh, which gives a uh, understanding of what is the underlying storage should look like and uh, application will give its requirements based on which the storage will be provisioned some of the requirements could be qos right quality of service steering provisioning data protection life cycle management right so everything will be governed by a policy and again there can be based on the application workloads there will be orchestration right like for for example provisioning decomposing taking the regular snapshot you know consuming the uh, the storage moving growing and shrinking storage right in the form of thin provisioning etc real focus on the real world requirement so basically you know the focus is really on the application because that's what is getting conf- uh, you know uh, um, exposed to the customer right the customer's real requirement is the application and uh, how um, is the underlying storage we don't need to really you know focus on the underlying subsystem right the ease of deployment so you can quickly spawn up a few containers or virtual machines uh, based on demand right and uh, it is self-contained right and the focus is on the application development and not on the deployment so why do we need composability, right? Because of the four important Vs, the value, the velocity, variety, and volume of the data that is coming in. The variety, each application has its own unique way of doing IOs, right? The workload generated from one by one application compared to the other is way different. Underutilized, avoid underutilized resources. As we said, if the, the traditional, uh, you know, com- computational architecture used to be in which uh, the, the CPU, the, it was, uh, um, you know, aggregated in such a way that the, the compute used to be associated with the storage. So you need to have a platform, et cetera, et cetera, for us to be able to um, uh, provision the storage, right? But if we treat storage as a pool of resources, you can definitely better utilize the resources in, 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 for for example, serverless compute, right? The serverless compute means to say that you don't need to really think about a server being existent for you to be able to use the compute or use the storage resources. You can think of a serverless model where you use the the, the compute and the store, storage, whatever is needed for that particular application to run and then free it up. Application cannot generate so much, uh, you know, workload that an, uh, you know, device can consume. So basically there are faster devices right now which cannot be fully utilized by one application. So you need to have multi-tenancy in multi-applications, multiple applications running on it, right? Parallelly for better utilization of the particular uh, underlying storage. Server limitations. The this number of slots and number of configurations are very much limited, right? For uh, for a particular hardware, so you cannot keep expanding. So you need to find virtual methods in which you can virtually uh, provision uh, CPU and compute uh, and uh, storage to uh, applications and uh, make the best out of the storage, right? Um, Speed of deployment and scale is very fast when it comes to composability in which you can, you know, scale up or you can um, uh, uh, scale out on demand uh, very quickly. How does a typical data center environment look like? Um, this is a, a, a data center for uh, Netflix, which is a prominent media uh, server, right? So it uh, renders uh, videos on demand. Uh, so there are uh, multiple devices like phones, tablets, and PCs which are accessing uh, Netflix or uh, the media server at uh, at any given time. So each device is very unique because the kind of ode- uh, the codex it supports, the video and audio audio codex it supports. So each um, device has a separate stream of um, I/O that is going in, and each device might be playing very different kind of a movie, right? Uh, or uh, each device might be doing a separate kind of a query, right? It could be doing a search, it could be doing analytics. Uh, the user might be just checking uh, for, uh, you know, uh, his, um, when is his um, uh, uh, login is going to expire, etc., etc., right? So given that uh, there is multi-tenancy, 
uh, in which ma many applications uh, or many uh, users are using this application at any given time, right? Uh, through different uh, different entry points. And multiple streams of these uh, applications are getting generated from each device. Um, when a user logs in, there is an elastic block uh, load balancer which which scales on demand. Uh, basically, if there are more there is more load, it it actually scales out. Uh, and uh, there is an edge proxy which takes all the uh, incoming uh, uh, requests and uh, hands it over to API Gateway. API Gateway decides what type of a service it is. When a typical user logs into Netflix, uh, for example, he he is there is multiple microservices that get uh, launched. One is for recommendations. One is for his active, uh, you know, what what was he last watching? When where was he at? What was the position of his last viewing? Right? Uh, what is the type of membership he has, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So multiple such streams of uh, 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 you know IO streams are getting generated, and each IO request is handled by a microservice. It could be a high priority it could be a low priority and the, the the storage that it might be going to for example login request might be going to a mysql cluster but a search request might be going to elk where there is a fuzzy search where the, the user might be misspelling a particular movie name or he might be searching from not just the title but uh, the actor for example so if he's doing some kind of a fuzzy search the the media server should render the the best available search results to him so each of these services can be termed a low priority or a high priority and if it needs to be immediately catered it is a high priority request so multiple events are getting generated there is multiple caching interfaces based on the use case like memcached or redis that will be coming into play and um, Finally, the, the movie that is stored in AWS S3 volume, which is basically an object store, uh, will have additional SDS, right? Software defined storage services like tiering, uh, like uh, high availability uh, zones, right? Uh, for disaster recovery, uh, it will be doing some backup and recovery at any given time. It might be locking the um, uh, object for, uh, it will be uh, right, right protecting it, etc., etc. And lots of such underlying services are going on at the same time with all that there is analytics happening based on the users uh, watching history so there is another you know engine that is running all the time to give him better recommendations suggest better movies to him etc with that uh, we we will talk a little more about how a data pipeline looks like the uh, data pipeline has uh, typically it has ingestion uh, where your applications are ingesting or, or uh, creating data and uh, storing it in a, a data lake, right? It's an unstructured data. So the application could be an ERP or a database, CRM, social media, uh, video platform, or it could be a device like sensor data, log data, right? Everything is getting stored in data lakes. It's a very unstructured format. Based on the use case of how the data should be used, it gets classified, right? There can be n number of classifications based on the model that you're wanting to generate. So based on the classification, the classific classified data, right, structured data warehouse uh, could be handed over to analytics or a third party application for further analysis like modeling and validation of um, you know the model being working correctly and after uh, it, it is done some comparison studies in the, in, in the preparation phase and uh, evaluation phase it is finally modeled and used in a business use case where there is an insight on how the machine learned algorithm is functioning and this whole process is a cyclical process in which there is uh, you know multiple data streams where there is multiple sources, multiple consumers, multiple different types of applications, multiple different types of streams, workload vary from application to application, multiple storage points where it is stored based on the kind of data it is. It's stored in a typical, uh, you know, uh, a, a database which is the most optimal for it or a NoSQL or a SQL database, etc. And then it undergoes each, at each point it undergoes a lot of changes, right? When it is classified, it is shrunk into thing and it is shredded. There is a little bit of unnecessary information taken away. So data is evolving or changing changing on a uh, on a daily basis in the data centers right 
Now let's, uh, you know, uh, uh, we will take a look at the enterprise storage workloads and uh, and our test methodology. And uh, Swati will uh, give you a um, uh, brief about all the subsequent slides. Thank you all for your time. Thanks, Shiva. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Swati and I'll be talking about enterprise storage workloads and our methodology for testing these workloads. So this is the list of top storage workloads which are relevant to enterprise storage, primarily all fresh uh, array technology. We can mainly categorize these workloads as primary, secondary and emerging. Primary uh, workloads are latency sensitive and uh, store structured data. Usually these are block based storage. Online transaction processing applications like databases and enterprise resource management applications are examples of primary storage workloads. Secondary workloads are uh, less latency sensitive and are mainly designed for supporting large data sets over extended periods of time. These systems store um, unstructured data, mainly um, they make use of uh, file or object based storage. Typical examples of secondary storage workloads are um, backup and disaster recovery related applications. And uh, emerging storage workloads consist of mainly big data analytics applications. These applications allow distributed processing of large data sets across clusters of compute systems. Um, applications for IoT, artificial intelligence and machine learning are designed with this architecture in mind. And uh, for these workloads, throughput, bandwidth, and scalability are extremely uh, critical. So all these workloads have their unique characteristics as shown in the table in the right. Um, like OLTP workloads are random, read, uh, random write heavy, whereas on the contrary, analytics workloads are sequential and uh, mostly uh, read heavy. So this is how real world workloads look like. Uh, typically in real world, uh, multiple applications like databases, analytics applications, VDI, and many other applications are deployed all at once on top of a storage device, uh, like an all flash array. And in this uh, mixed workload environment, giving consistent performance becomes quite challenging for the underlying storage as each application generates a unique IO request profile to the storage uh, device. The IO access pattern also changes as it traverses through the operating system stack and gets impacted by OS activities like fragmentation, merging, etc. There can be impact of other enterprise features as well like compression, encryption, deduplication, virtualization and, and any other enterprise features. And the most important thing to note about the access pattern generated by real world applications is that the access pattern is constantly changing. The access pattern generated um, is has varying queue depths, idle times, IO bursts and IO block sizes. With this background, uh, now let's look at some of the enterprise storage test recommendations. Ideally for testing enterprise storage for production environment readiness, we should be testing in, in an environment which is as close as possible to production environments. Testing should include different environments of a data center, um, which will help in bringing out the issues which are only found in production environments. We should create data sets, data streams, and workflows uh, designed to model real world workloads by collecting historical data from a production environment and using this data for simulating the IO profiles of a production environment. We should combine workloads as testing with a mixture of workloads will help in understanding whether these workloads will perform uh, adequately on the storage system. Workloads uh, should reflect real application behavior. Real world applications have hotspots and locality, and these applications access particular locations on the storage device um, more frequently than other storage locations. Um, we should be testing the storage system with different enterprise features like deduplication, compression, etc., as these features will have impact on the performance of the underlying storage. 
Today, most applications are deployed on hypervisor-based platforms. So we should also measure the impact of virtualization on the performance. Finally, we should be able to generate the kind of load uh, that will adequately stress the storage under test. And the test should reflect real application behavior and realistic traffic patterns. Um, testing with corner tests, uh, corner tests like 100% random write or random read is not enough and definitely will prevent from proper eval evaluation of a storage system. Today, the most commonly used tools for testing storage are traditional block testing tools like IOMeter, VDBench, FIO. Um, these tools were originally designed for measuring performance of disk drives in terms of IOPS and throughput with predefined standard access patterns. These tools simply cannot create the test patterns of a production environment. These tools offer um, also offer very limited uh, or no IO burst control. The other set of tools are application testing tools like HammerDB, YCSB, uh, which is the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark, Sysbench, etc. These tools are primarily used for application testing, um, mainly database, database related applications. Um, since these tools provide predefined pre synthetic tests, they offer limited control in terms of tuning the tests uh, they provide. Most of these tools come uh, with their own format of reporting and are very difficult to customize as per the needs. Preparing the environment and infrastructure on multiple host systems to perform load tests with these tools is a very tedious task. Also, these tools require manual interventions to scale up and scale down the load test. So let's look at some challenges for testing enterprise storage. The first foremost challenge is that application workloads are continuously evolving. We are seeing newer and newer applications getting developed and learning IO patterns from these applications is highly time consuming. Another challenge is that uh, testing broad range of storage products is complex and um, uh, it's a big challenge right now to generate, debug and reproduce these workloads as uh, setting up data center uh, software stack takes a very long time. Hence, for testing storage devices for pro uh, production environment readiness, we need to move to a test environment which looks like a real-world environment. Um, today, there are mainly two approaches for uh, uh, to test enterprise storage systems. We can either simulate the workloads of a production environment or we can emulate the different workloads of a real world of, of real world applications. Simulation based methods involve capturing the access pattern of an application work workload in a customer or a production environment. So getting access to a production environment is very difficult and uh, simulation based uh, methods also have their own learning curve for adding support uh, for different workloads as a learning IO patterns from newer applications is highly time consuming. So uh, we have chosen the emulation approach. We are emulating real world workloads by deploying various applications in our test environment. With the advancements of technologies like containerization and virtualization, building such an environment is quite feasible and a much uh, faster solution as compared to simulation based methods. Also, this way we'll be quickly adapting to newer applications and use cases by adding them to our emulation test framework. So this is how we are emulating a real world test environment. We are building a test ecosystem where on top of our enterprise storage systems, we are identifying and deploying um, uh, enterprise application workloads. Our test automation framework is basically a Python based framework, mainly built on top of open source technologies for saving cost. With the help of automation, the framework enables uh, testing of underlying storage by quickly enabling integration of multiple real world workloads. Uh, it enables heavy load generation and it also has the ability to visualize the generated workload. So um, uh, let's uh, look at all the layers of the framework um, from the bottom. 
um, to achieve composability of the underlying hardware resources, um, we are making use of OpenStack, which composes from the available hardware resource pool and uh, provisions bare metal uh, VMs or containers as per the need. On top of these provisioned VMs or containers, various storage services like caching, tiering, replication, um, etc. can be enabled with the help of storage providers like Minio and Ceph. Um, this gives the flexibility to expose the storage to upper layer as a block object or file on which multiple application workloads uh, can be deployed. For example, uh, big data analytics applications, media servers, web servers, etc. Et um, for, lo for load generation, we have dockerized our client applications and we are orchestrating multiple replicas of these clients using Docker Swarm and Kubernetes uh, clustering, um, which helps in uh, replicating thousands of client containers and generate load uh, like a real world by scaling out to various systems with a single command. Finally, we have configured intelligent services for understanding the workload. Um, these services are continuously pulling for logs, telemetry, events data, and logging it continuously. We are making use of ELK Kibana, uh, Kibana for capturing and visualizing the load generation. We have integrated uh, multiple log collection and disk statistics collection services like log stash, uh, metric beat, uh, with Kibana visualization. For capturing IO access patterns, we are utilizing uh, block trace utility. So uh, with our uh, test framework, uh, mainly we can quickly build a test environment, which is very close to a production environment. And uh, with the help of all these intelligent services, we can analyze and compare test results um, in real time across, uh, across uh, various test systems. So uh, we have only recently started this work and we are still working on integrating various features and workloads. These are some of the features we have integrated so far. And here is the list of workloads we have enabled in our test framework. Um, to emulate a typical mixed workload um, real world environment for storage systems um, like all flash arrays, for the, um, uh, for, for the OLTP use case, we have deployed a, a Ceph cluster with enterprise services like caching and tiering enabled. On top of the Ceph block storage, we have deployed MySQL database and integrated a retail web store which stores all its data in the MySQL database. We have enabled the analytics use case by deploying a Splunk cluster. We have configured a Splunk disaggregated smart store on Minio backend enabled with a distributed eraser code. And uh, finally, we have enabled the media streaming use case by deploying a Nginx uh, media server configured on top of Minio backend, uh, which, uh, where we are storing all the streaming data. For load generation, we are making use of JMeter. Um, it's open source, platform independent, and a robust tool for load generation and reporting. We have uh, integrated the web server hosted on MySQL, um, the Splunk indexer nodes, and uh, Nginx uh, media server with the JMeter HTTP connector. To continuously generate load to these applications, we have also prepared JMeter Docker containers and in integrated them as services on Docker Swarm container orchestration. Um, Docker Swarm mainly enables replication and spawning of these JMeter services and helps in scaling out, scaling in, in of these services as per the um, load desired for the test. These are some of the IO access patterns that got generated by the MySQL, OLTP, and MinIO media, media streaming workload. This is a 10 second capture uh, taken with um, BLK Trace, and we can see varying block sizes in both the workloads. Diverse block sizes starting from 4K to 1 MB can be seen. 
as mysql is predominantly doing writes the generated workload is write he write heavy uh, uh, for mysql whereas the media streaming workload generated by minio is read heavy um, as mainly we are rendering videos and streaming them a, st a, a standard benchmarking tool will only create the access patterns specified and cannot create so many diverse access patterns seamlessly since we are generating load from jmeter docker uh, we compared our load generation results with benchmarking tools like hammerdb hammerdb supports the tpcc test which is popularly used to benchmark databases like mysql we configured hammerdb with the warehouse on top of mysql and configured it to generate continuous load from multiple virtual users to the warehouse on mysql to compare the hammerdb load generation with our framework we deployed multiple jmeter docker services these jmeter docker services primarily act as multiple users generating load to the web, so uh, web store that we have configured on top of mysql we were able to achieve higher load than hammerdb uh, with fewer jmeter docker services as shown in the graph uh, our also our workload is having a higher um, is having higher io bursts in comparison to hammerdb as we are building uh, this framework we will have more results to showcase in future as we enable and integrate other workloads and features into the framework so this brings us to the end of our talk in conclusion um, we have shown that real world applications are very diverse in nature and uh, benchmarking tools are not sufficient to simulate every io pattern uh, uh, we demonstrated how we are using virtualization containers composability and sds to emulate a real world production environment um, for doing enterprise testing and for future work um, we plan to improve our workload modeling um, closer to a real world application operation behaviors using um, load generation parameterization um, for example jmeter supports parameterization to enable real world uh, data sets we'll be identifying and integrating various other um, client load generation tools and containerizing them to enable scale out testing we'll be integrating other workloads like vdi and uh, we'll be enabling various other enterprise features like dedupe compression um, on top of our workloads for, uh, for a more um, closer uh, real world production environment these are some of the references uh, that we used for this work and uh, we really want to thank our team members uh, who have contributed towards this work um please uh, please feel free to contact us for any queries thank you everybody and have a good day